Today we're looking at two different mishaps where pilots tried to land behind a helicopter and instantly regretted it, starting with this first one. This is a UH-60 that's taking off. It's gonna leave the frame here in a second. Pay attention to this clock down here, and I want you to think about how much separation do you really think you need if you're taking off or landing behind a helicopter. This is some dangerous stuff. I'm Hoover and welcome to your pilot debrief. Now we're gonna talk about the second mishap later on in this video, but this first incident happened in Fort Collins, Colorado, and this is a picture of the aircraft after it crashed and thankfully the pilot did survive. And the truth is this was actually a student pilot and he's flying a Cirrus SR-20 and this guy is on his second solo flight and he only has about 30 hours of flying experience. So he's basically brand new to aviation. Now, if you're not familiar, Fort Collins is just north of Denver. You can see the airfield field right here. This shows they have an operational control tower, but at the time of the incident happened, it was an uncontrolled field. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about the role that that actually might have played in all of this. Now, at this airfield, you've got one main runway. It's runway 1533. It's 8,500 feet long. And because there's several military installations not far from Fort Collins, it's not uncommon to see helicopters flying around. And like I mentioned earlier, the one you saw in the video was a UH-60. And I'll talk more and a little bit about that specific type of helicopter. Now, according to the written narrative of the student pilot, he was supposed to be doing his second solo, and he had already done a flight with the instructor where they did a touch and go and then a second landing to a full stop. Now, they taxi back for the instructor to get out of the aircraft, and the student said that when they were doing their full stop, they had observed the Blackhawk on maneuvers in the pattern and on the airport. But I guess they don't talk about it or discuss wake turbulence because the student doesn't say anything about it. And unfortunately, there's no record of interviewing the instructor. So instead, the student just taxis out and he takes off to begin his solo flight. And if you're a flight instructor, think about what guidance you give your student in this type of scenario or what you might do if it was you actually flying the plane and you knew there was a Blackhawk operating in the pattern. Now the solo flight is uneventful until he gets back into the pattern and that's when things start going downhill. He says he saw the Blackhawk in the pattern and he entered on the downwind, but look at what he says right here. He says, I continued to follow the Blackhawk in the pattern. Now he doesn't say what altitude the Blackhawk is at, but how far do you think you should fly behind a helicopter in the traffic pattern? Now most pilots know about wake turbulence from larger heavy aircraft, but they don't think about it as much when it comes to helicopters because we just don't fly around them a lot. And I think a lot of pilots just assume that the wake turbulence from a helicopter, maybe it just goes straight down and it's just not going to generate enough that would actually have an effect on your aircraft. And I'm gonna keep calling it wake turbulence throughout this video, but it's also called rotor wash or technically wake vortices. Now the FAA did a test a while back to see what the wake turbulence from a helicopter would do to an aircraft. And they took a UH-60 that weighed about 15,000 pounds for the test and a T-34 aircraft. And I know a lot of the Navy and the Marine pilots should be familiar with the T-34, but here's what that looks like. And it weighs about 3,000 pounds and it has about a 550 horsepower turboprop engine. Now keep that in mind because the Cirrus is about a thousand pounds lighter and it only has about 215 horsepower. So obviously it's a very different scenario, but in the test when the T-34 was about a mile behind the UH-60, it was seeing bank angles up to 45 degrees. And at one mile, they got bank angles up to 90 degrees. But here's the kicker. As soon as that UH-60 slowed down to an approach speed, that T-34, when it was a mile back, it rolled beyond 90 degrees. And at a half mile, it rolled beyond 180 degrees of bank. So basically a half mile behind a helicopter on approach, that T-34 is going inverted. That's just crazy. And I'm gonna share with you the FAA recommendation for separation in a minute. But first, the student pilot is just following this Blackhawk around in the pattern. And frankly, he's just lucky that he didn't get too close. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't be alive today. But what he does next is what a lot of student pilots might do when they're following a fixed wing aircraft in the pattern. And he says he waited for the Blackhawk to turn base and then final passing his left wing before he turned base. But he realizes right away that this is going to be a problem because he continued to watch the Blackhawk on final and he seemed to slow down, which is typical for a helicopter. And he looked to be touching down on the numbers on the end of runway 33. 
At this point, the smart thing to do would be to just break off the pattern and wait until you have enough separation. And for a second, it seemed like that was the plan because he turned final and then the Blackhawk called him and asked him if he was on final. He said that he was, but could go around because the Blackhawk was basically slow to clear the active runway. And if you're thinking that if the helicopter would just sidestep over to the taxiway instead of going down the runway that you'd be fine, then you need to stick around to the end of this video because I'm going to show you in a second in the next mishap just how dangerous that can be. But first, in this situation, if they had a tower controller, there is a small chance that the tower would have, knowing that it's a student solo, told him to just go around. But instead, ironically, the Blackhawk advised the student pilot there was no need for a go around and he would clear the active runway Alpha 3. And you can see that's about halfway down the runway, so it's going to take him a second or two to get there. But the bigger issue here is don't ever let anyone tell you that you don't need to go around if you're thinking about doing it. If you feel like you need to go around, make the decision and do it. And I think because he's a student pilot, he kind of lets the Blackhawk talk him into not going around. And I'm not sure how the Blackhawk pilot can even make that recommendation anyway, because the guy had no idea where he was. He had to ask him if he was on final, so he clearly can't see behind him to know where the student pilot is right now. So the student continues the approach, saying that he was already high and above the glide slope, anticipating the need to go around, and he was also thinking about touching down long and the numbers beyond where the Blackhawk had touched down. And after the radio call, he saw the Blackhawk reach the first taxiway and exit the active runway. And after seeing this, he decided to continue with his landing and just land longer down the runway. Now, if we go back to the beginning of the video, unfortunately, it starts right here. So it shows that the UH-60 is already airborne. So I'm not sure if he actually touched down or not. But the thing you need to realize is that if you're landing behind a helicopter, if they do touch down and then they lift off again, that's going to be much stronger vortices because of that initial lift required. And also, if they're going to fly down the runway like this guy is doing in the video, then there really isn't a touchdown point. So you can't really land long. And basically, your only option is to give yourself enough time separation. But if you're wondering how much time, well, if you go back and watch the video again in the beginning, you're going to see it was just about 30 seconds from the time that the UH-60 left the center of the frame until the student pilot started to crash. But check this out. Did you notice this right at the very end of the video here? Watch as he crashes and watch what all the dust does. Now, I know a lot of that's blowing because of his momentum, you know, scattering that way. But you can see that it was basically blowing to the right. And when the FAA looked at this, they saw that the winds were 110 at three knots. So basically, they have a small quartering tailwind. And that means that the vortices from the UH-60 are going to stay over the runway a lot longer. So 30 seconds is not going to be enough time. But I'm going to share the FAA recommendation with you in a second. First, I just want to show you this other clip because it's a very similar situation. You've got a Cessna 120 and a UH-1 Huey helicopter. Now, the UH-1 is obviously a lot smaller than the UH-60. But watch what happens in this video. You're going to see that UH-1 cross the runway from left to right here. And then he's going to go down basically parallel to the runway off to the right. And he's going to sit in a hover. But pay attention to the clock here up at the top left hand side of the screen to see how much separation there is between the two aircraft. That was just under 30 seconds, and the only thing the NTSB said in their investigation of this was that pilots should avoid taxiing or flying within a distance of three rotor diameters of a helicopter. So that's about 150 feet for a UH-60 or a UH-1. And the problem is most pilots only apply that distance to when they're taxiing. And so they don't think about parallel taxiways, how those could be within 150 feet of the runway center line. So if there's a helicopter hovering on that taxiway, that could be a real problem when you're trying to land or take off. But the other problem with that recommendation is that the mishap took place in 2022. That was just last year. If we go back to the first mishap that I showed you in this video, that took place in 2014. And the NTSB said that contributing to that accident was the lack of FAA wake turbulence separation criteria for a small airplane following a helicopter. 
And still today, the FAA has not issued any guidance on the minimum airborne separation between fixed wing and rotary wing aircraft. And that's why I'd always err on the conservative side. I think that three miles should keep you safe in the pattern and at least two minutes for takeoff and landing should be sufficient. But if you aren't sure, just go around and get more separation. And if you learned something from this pilot debrief, then check out this other one on the channel and I'll see you next time.